What do you get when you combine a famous filmmaker, an amateur detective, and an unsolved mystery? You get a short-lived TV series from 1984, one that we'll be remembering on this installment of Anthology of Anthology TV Shows. Welcome to the first video in our new series about Anthology TV. You're probably already familiar with shows like Black Mirror, Goosebumps, or The Twilight Zone. On this web series, we'll be looking at a broad range of anthology TV shows. The Forgotten Ones, our favorite ones, and the ones that deserve to be rediscovered. From the sublime to the bizarre. With anthology shows, each episode gives you different actors, different characters, different directors. Sometimes the only connecting thread is the show's host, like The Hitchhiker. According to the rule of the streets, love and business don't mix. Or Vincent Price. There's something stealthy about fog. Or even Sir Mix-a-Lot. A blast from the past, trapped in a time warp. Get it together, baby. In this video, we're looking at three different anthology shows that were hosted by an icon of American media. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Orson Welles. Orson Welles became famous doing radio, and by the time he directed his first feature film, he was already a well-known talent. But by the mid-1950s, another guy was giving Welles a run for his money as the world's most famous film director. Good evening, television consumers. For 11 years, Alfred Hitchcock hosted his own television series, starting in 1955 with seven seasons of Alfred Hitchcock Presents, immediately followed by four seasons of the Alfred Hitchcock Hour. Hitchcock was ahead of the curve when it came to personal branding. At the time, he was the only director to appear on the posters for his movies. The film's biggest star was its director, and Alfred Hitchcock was a household name. Now maybe Orson Welles thought Hitchcock's stardom gave him some clout in Hollywood, and if he had a TV show, he could get movies funded and get final cut. So in 1956, Welles made a deal where Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz would bankroll a pilot for an Orson Welles TV show. According to Hollywood legend, Welles immediately spent the entire budget on himself. Take this away, please. And and bring me the steak of props, thanks a lot. He went on vacation and hadn't filmed a thing. There is something here that needs explaining. Lucy and Desi were pissed. This guy owed them a half an hour of television. So he quickly produced a pilot, and to save money, Wells hired himself to write the screenplay, do the musical arrangement, the production design, and direction, in addition to hosting the show. Wait a minute, we're getting uh, ahead of ourselves. The Orson Welles Show is an inventive little thing. Darling, cried the bride, you've become famous. What's all this about eternal youth? This low-budget 30-minute pilot utilizes rear projection, still photos, and other visual trickery, reminding viewers that before Wells was a filmmaker, he was a magician. Sorry to keep you hanging around. <laughs> Today's critics call the show a radical mini-masterpiece, claiming it could have reinvented television. But maybe that says more about the websites than the show itself. In 1958, two years after it was shot, NBC aired the pilot as Fountain of Youth as part of the Colgate Theater. Supposedly, the network thought the show was too sophisticated, so the Orson Welles show did not get picked up. Does he ever think of us? No, he just thinks of himself. Lucy and Desi were disappointed, but would go on to produce a science fiction script called The Time Element, which was kind of a prototype for The Twilight Zone except it was hosted by Desi Arnaz. Tonight, we're gonna see a story written by Rod Serling and starring William Bendix. We'll save that for another video. Cut to 1973. Orson Welles hosted his next anthology series titled Orson Welles' Great Mysteries. Unfortunately, it did not involve the filmmaker investigating unsolved crimes. Rather, it was adaptations of suspense tales by authors like O. Henry, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and even Charles Dickens. If these mysteries look like low-budget BBC costume dramas from the 1970s, it's because that's exactly what they are. 
Wells was neither writing nor directing, but he was doing two things on the show, introducing each episode and picking up a paycheck. But a lot of us still devoutly hope that this is nonsense. And by the look of it, I think he taped every intro in one afternoon. Comedy nerds will recognize this show as the source of Michael Palin's Orson Welles impression. The follies of my youth. Men's youth. <laughs> Men's youth. <laughs> now, if you didn't grow up watching Orson Welles' Great Mysteries, you might not be that impressed by it. But even today's most jaded viewers will dig the opening credits, with Welles lurking around a bombed-out London in a stylish hat and cape all set to a mesmerizing score by John Barry. Ten years later, Orson Welles would host his final anthology show, this time for American television. And it did go to series, however briefly. By the 1980s, Welles was doing a lot of work for hire, like narrating movie trailers. Another milestone in motion picture history. Revenge of the Nerds. And playing a robot planet. I am a unicron. But there's no question, the man brought his A-game to every gig. Last night I journeyed backwards in time to the medieval world of Dark Tower. Well, almost every gig. Ah, the French champagne. But most of the time, producers got their money's worth. We will sell no wine before it's time. Not only did Wells bring his rich baritone, he brought an air of expertise and spoke with great authority about everything from Nostradamus. He was a respected French physician whose predictions of the future have mystified scholars for over 400 years. To casino gambling. Over here we have Blackjack. That's Orson Welles playing Blackjack, not to be confused with Jack Black playing Orson Welles. Kane would have seen the film. In 1984, just a year before his death, Orson Welles brought his authoritative elegance to a primetime presentation about murder. In scene of the crime, someone's been killed, and the detective is you. Can you solve the murders and determine the killer's identity? So much for the theory that watching TV is passive. You've got to solve a homicide. A murder has just been committed in the study. And then, assuming you enjoy a challenge, you'll have a chance to solve the crime. Will there be police or detectives? No police, no detectives. It's just you and me. That's cool. I mean, that's what most of us are already doing when we watch a murder mystery. We try to figure out who done it. Scene of the Crime leans into this idea and makes it a fun gimmick. Fun fact, this interactive mystery aired just months before Parker Brothers released the Clue VCR game. You and your friends will find a new mystery every time you play Clue VCR. In Scene of the Crime's pilot episode, Marky Post plays a young bride who gets killed on her wedding night. Maybe when you stop being so angry, you could give me a call. You have to pay attention to all the clues. She's got some bruises on the back of her neck. And remember that no one can be trusted. The plumbing's been shut off since noon. Throughout the episode, you hear from each suspect. It's no secret that I, I didn't care for my brother's new wife. Killer. I loved her. Skiing accident. Almost broke my neck. All right, I do enjoy my wine and my scotch on occasion. And if that's not enough of a gimmick, there are celebrities playing along. Here's your chance to match wits with our guest detectives who've made their own deductions. So I think it was a combination of the doctor and the butler. I think I have a good idea who the killer is, but I really better not say. Had to be the butler. I hate to be obvious, but it had to be the butler. It's like a murder mystery version of the marriage ref. This interactive series only lasted six episodes, with titles like The Medium is the Murder and A Vote for Murder. I guess the writers thought these titles would sound less corny when read by Orson Welles. Well, don't be too cocky. Scene of the Crime is a fun series that's full of surprises, like appearances by Alan Thicke. The pressures of a long campaign can take its toll. And Dennis Franz. Me kill him? 
I got over a million bucks sunk in that guy. Some of you are thinking, this is just another quick paycheck for Orson Welles. What else could it have been? Maybe you're right, and maybe Scene of the Crime is forgotten by TV history. But one sequence will always be remembered by impressionable children of the 1980s. The babysitter episode is the stuff of nightmares. It was like a slasher movie was airing during Sunday night TV. It looks like this kid is about to be killed by her sadistic babysitter. But here's the twist. That little girl was given a magical gift from a party clown. One day, you're going to want to make a wish. When that special day comes, Trisha, you'll be waiting. And when she wished for that figurine to protect her, it committed a murder. <laughs> you know, that magician isn't the show's only loyal servant. Till then, I remain as always obediently yours. Thanks for everything, Orson. I hope Scene of the Crime helped pay for the other side of the wind. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe to Atomic Abe for future videos about anthology shows like the Jonathan Demi comedy series that featured David Byrne in his underwear yelling at Rosanna Arquette. I want a pie from a store. I want a store-bought pie. What does my being loaded have to do with anything?